Hello, welcome to The Horticulturalist. I am Matthew Lucas. And I'm Stephen Ryan. And we do post every week on a Friday, so do hit subscribe if you want to follow our continuing horticultural adventures, Stephen. Yes, and today we're going to talk about a group of plants that does tend to galvanise people into different camps, and that is green flowering plants. Green flowering plants. Now, we have been filming this over a few seasons to kind of get a few interesting examples, but why don't we start with the first one that's actually... Right here. Right here. Stephen, green flowering plants. I have many questions, but <laughs> let's start with the one that is before us, which looks to me like an arum. Well, in fact, it's sometimes called an arum, but, and we did talk about arums in a previous We uh, did, which video. we will link. This is actually a xanthodesia. They're a group of um, aroids that mm. come from southern Africa. Flowers and, look the same. Yeah, they do. All right, all right, but they're, they're, they're botanically different. But their they're lady boy bits will be different. Yes, exactly. And so this is xanthodesia ethiopicum green goddess. The normal form is the classical white flowered lily that everybody yes. sees and that is quite a weedy sort of plant in some parts of Australia. Yep. Not so sure the green one's any better from the weedy perspective, but it mm. doesn't seem to have found its way out into the wild like the white one has. Yep. And this is a cut flower par excellence. Well, let's talk about cut flowers then. So, because this is my bigger question, why green flowers? Why would a plant, first of all, evolve to have a green flower isn't it all about attracting pollinators and they're attracted <laughs> to color and fragrance so yeah. why 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 Stephen to be honest with you I think there's probably several reasons and I don't know the answer to almost any of them uh, sometimes it's an aberrant thing where the the chlorophyll just ends up going through the flower parts yep. and in the case of this one I'm sure that's what it is because the normal form is white yep. this one has just got the green chlorophyll has gone right up through the the um, space the the floral part of the flower mm. and it still has white down in the center so you can see it's still white there yeah and it does make a very very good cut flower hardiness light water almost unkillable except in the <laughs> coldest of climates <laughs> and you do find these uh, they grow in sort of bogs temporary seeps and drainage ditches mm. in their natural habitat mm. so they love water but they mm. you know they can cope with dry periods as well mm. so the xanthodesias particularly of the ethiopia form do become weedy in lots of places so you do have to keep that in mind but where it's uh, a perfectly safe plant to plant. You can even grow it in the edge of a pond, so it right. can even be a marginal water plant. Bolton shade. Yours isn't a bit of dappled light. Yeah, they probably do grow into bigger, fatter plants if they've got a fair bit of light. Mm. So I wouldn't put them in heavy shade, but they'll mm. cope with full sun through to semi shade. Well, I think we should go and look at our second of seven green flowering plant, which is an arum, which this isn't. <laughs> fair enough. All right, another cab off the rank when it comes to green flowering plants. Uh, the arums. There are a number of species that have green flowers and this particular one, Arum hygrophyllum, is a wonderful green flower with a purple spadex in the middle and just a very fine burgundy line around the edge of the space. So it's a beautiful plant, grows up to about a metre and a half tall and flowers in the late winter. And of course we did do a video specifically on this genus of plants. So if you want to know more about arums, I would suggest you go in and have a look at that one and we'll put the link below. So that arum was an arum. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> As opposed to the arum lily that's not an arum. Yeah, anyhow, you it is what it is. It is what it is. Well, where did we go to next? Look at something green and fabulous. Well, we probably are stepping back further into the winter. Yes. So we're going to have to go into the time machine as well. And we're going to have a look at some of the green flowering hellebores. Exactly, and we made a hellebore epic and this hellebore was actually shot in Peter, who we made that hellebore program with garden. Mm. So let's have a look. This has got to be one of the quintessential winter flowering green flowering plants. This is one of the forms of Helleborus fetidus, which goes under the rather unfortunate name of the stinking hellebore, because fetidus means fetid. It doesn't actually have a nasty smell. Apparently the smell is from the root system if you're stupid enough to pull it out of the ground. Uh, this is a selection that was bred in America called Red Silver. It's got the most beautiful reddish uh, petioles, the leaf stems, and it also has a little bit of red that shows up in the flower bell as well. 
makes a nice squat dumpy plant. Uh, the foliage is good all year round and then you get these wonderful green bell-like flowers in the winter. I think it's a fabulous plant. All right, so from one hellebore to another. Uh, hellebore. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm a convert now, well, you know. Yeah, You've yes. converted me to hellebores. Yeah, so we're going to look at another species and we're going to throw in a free euphorbia while we're at Why it. Why not? But a quick question. Mm -hmm. Pollinators. I'm still bemused by green. So green flowers in the wild, what would pollinate them? Well, they're generally insect pollinated, so the mm. insects do find them. Bees will pollinate a green flower, but mm. they're often uh, attracted to scents and shapes and other things as well as colour. So shape uh, plays a part. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, I guess, because that's why some flowers mimic insects. Yeah. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so they can see shapes, so uh, they would still pick up on what a flower was, whether it be green or white or red or pink or mm. whatever. And sometimes it's the guide marks that the flower has in it that actually pulls the insect into where like the... landing marks. Yeah, so they, and they see colours in different ways than we do, so quite probably they don't see green flowers as green. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's go look at another one, another hellebore. What a good idea. Right, green flowers. I adore them. And this one's another one of a classical green flowering type plant. This is Helleborus argutifolius, the Corsican hellebore, which I've actually seen growing in the mountains of Corsica. Wonderful plant, very sculptural, prickly looking foliage, and these heads of really attractive, clear apple green flowers, virtually all winter long. So grows to about a metre, metre and a half tall. Unlike the other hellebores, you take whole stems out when they're finished flowering and the new stems will come up from ground level. So it's an easy plant to keep, more sun tolerant than most hellebores. So give it a reasonably open sunny spot in a border and it will give you interest in the border all year round. And interestingly enough, thinking green flowers, at the base here, in a much more chartreuse shade of green, we have a euphorbia rigida, which is one of the very attractive, uh, smaller growing euphorbia species. And of course, if you want to know more about hellebores, why don't you check out our hellebore video and we'll put the link below. Hellebore, hellebore, what's next, Stephen? Well, we're going into a different direction altogether and yep. we're going to look at one of the several green flowered um, tobaccos, so the Nicotianas. That's right, and that was a glorious high summer, so let's step back into midsummer. Another green flower, Mr. Ryan. Yes, they are great in the garden, they really are. This, although it's so subtle, it literally leapt out at me. It it's does. So sculptural. Tell yeah. us everything. All right, well, this is an ornamental tobacco. Uh -huh. uh, so a Nicotiana. Can you smoke it? <laughs> Possibly, but you might not live through the experience. Uh, there's a lot of toxins in this genus, so, you know, and when you think about it, tobacco's got lots of toxins in it anyway. Fair but there enough, you go. fair enough. Don't try it at home. No, don't try it at home. So just because it's a tobacco, it doesn't mean that it's actually a viable alternative crop. But it is a great garden plant. Uh, it will grow up to two to even three metres, potentially. Really? So it can be quite a large plant. It's a short-lived perennial. Mm -hmm. I tend to pull them out when they get a bit scruffy looking after a few years. Mm. Uh, it gets these towering flower spikes and flowers for months actually. It can be in flower sort of right through the mid to late summer through into the end of autumn. It has these wonderful lime green flowers with an almost sort of deep green, almost olivey green tip to them. And yeah. it's a really interesting flower shape as well because you've got these strange little bells that sort of flare out a bit at the end, then constrict again and then flare out. So it's a really pretty plant, well worth growing in the garden. It will mildly self-seed. So I just rely on self-sown seedlings coming up. Yeah. It's reasonably cold hardy. I don't think it would go down to very low temperatures, but then you could use it as a bedding plant and use it mainly as an annual. Because, well, two things. Firstly, the the young leaves of the, the, the new plants mm. are gorgeous unto yeah. themselves, sort of a grey green. Where is it from? It's from Peru, so it's South American. Uh, apparently restricted to Peru, though. It doesn't seem to have shown up in any other country. I do warn people, though, that some of the ornamental tobaccos can become weedy in certain climates. Mm. Haven't seen any sign of this one doing it, but there is one called Nicotiana glauca, which is a big evergreen shrub with grey leaves and green flowers, yep. and it has become weedy in quite a few countries. Mm. So I guess check in your local area. Yep. Hardiness, this is in full sun. I yep. mean, if it's self-seeding, it's going to find where it wants to be. Well, it does. It tends to do that. But I find I have them come up in full sun. This one's actually growing in a gravel path. Uh, I also have them in um, semi-shade so it pops up in sort of odd spots where you don't expect it but like a lot of self-seeders you'll get seedlings that come up where you don't want them so you just 
pluck them out quite mm. quickly. Mm. But you will have seedlings that will come up of their own and somehow or another seem to come up just where they look right. So Well, this one does. It's on the pathway and it looks stunning. Now, what have you seen that pollinates it? Have you seen pollinators on this? I've seen some butterflies on it, but apart from that, I haven't really seen terribly many sort of insects attracted to it. I'm assuming they are, though. Because you get viable seeds. Oh, yes, plenty of them. So, yes, yeah, so it does get pollinated, and I'm assuming by an insect of some sort. Could it be, although generally you've said that white flowering things are attracted to or attracting of nighttime pollinators, mm. would that come into play with green colour pigments? Look, it could. Uh, I mean, they're not as obvious in the night light, but then we've got to remember we don't have eyes like insects either. Mm. <laughs> and so they often see colours in different ways than we do. So the green flower might to the retina of a moth or whatever come up looking white. Who knows? Because maybe that's why you've not seen a pollinator on it, because yeah. it's at night. It could be. I need to come out with a torch. You do. <laughs> there you go. Don't smoke it. No, definitely <laughs> not. And nor would I smoke the next plant. So we're going to have a look. <laughs> I don't know, you know, it's a wild weekend. Yeah, no. Nah. Well, it'd be an expensive smoking apart from anything else. But we're going to have a look at a really pretty green flowered bulb, one of the fritillarias. I, oh, fritillarias are tricky. Let's have mm. a look. We've now moved on to a friend's garden to have a look at yet another green flower. And can I just say, this is Sam's friend. Oh my goodness, he has the most amazing things in pots. Yes, Steven. beautiful bulbs. Oh. And this one fits the bill for our topic for this week, which of course is green flowers. And this is one of the charming and not too hard to grow fritillarias. Yes, because they do have a bit of a bad rap, don't they? As being mm. tricky. The problem is that there's so many different species from different habitats and each of them require slightly different treatment. So there's some that need to dry off in the summer, some that come from damp meadows, yep. some that are more high alpine. So there's a whole range of different species. Some of the Californian ones, in fact, should grow quite well in our Victorian climate. Yeah. Uh, if we can source them, uh, they're tenuously in the country. Mm. But this particular one, uh, Fritillaria thumbergii, mm -hmm. is from Central Asia and it's a comparatively easy one. It doesn't need a dry summer dormancy mm. and it actually has an interesting characteristic about it. Not only does it have these lovely tessellated green flowers, but it also produces little tendrily bits on the ends of the top leaves. I was saying, because that reminds me of the Gloriosa um, Rothschildiana, is yes, that it? Uh, yes. Which clings from the end of its leaf. So and this, this does the same. It will grow in uh, meadows and pasture areas. And cling to other... Cling to the grasses oh. uh, to hold itself up so that it doesn't flop over. Because it's not such a tall grower though, is no, it? No, no, it's not. It, it's around about the metre up, uh, about uh, full size. Mm. And you get multiple flowers per stem. Uh, it's an early spring flowering species yeah. and it multi multiplies gratifyingly. So it clumps up reasonably. <laughs> well, once you ungratifying. Yeah, well, some of them are very slow. In fact, there's some fertile areas that basically don't multiply by the bulb at all. They just mm get a slightly bigger bulb every year and you have to raise those from seed if you're going to get quantity. Mm. Whereas this one can in fact produce quite a lot of little bulbs around the existing larger bulbs. Mm. So you can get lots of baby plants quite quickly. And I think it's clear too, just what a handsome potted specimen it is. So if you want you to just grow it in a pot, it looks amazing. And it seems as though that this is supporting itself because it's it's quite um, perpendicular and it's not floppy. So yeah. they're obviously clinging to each other. In fact, it, it is. You can see where the tendrils are sort of linked around each other. Yeah. So the you know enough bulbs in a pot, and yes, they will hold themselves up. So Central Asia doesn't need a dry summer dormancy. No. What other growing conditions though? It will cope sun. with semi shade to more or less full sun. Yeah. Um, uh, parts of our state here of Victoria may actually be too torridly hot in the summer. Mm. But of course, growing them in a pot means that you can move them around. So you can have them out in more sun when they're in flower yeah. and enjoy them. You can move them back into the shade a little bit more when they go dormant in the summer. Yeah. So yes, you can adapt with mm. them. So I think that would work quite well. And they are used as a garden plant in England. So you can in fact plant them out in the garden as well if Could you wish. Could we do that here? Yeah, look, you, you can grow um, Thumbergia in the ground. Uh, the only trouble I have with fritillaries in the ground is that many of them are rather prone to slug and snail attack. So unless you keep on top of the predators, 
you can just get them up looking lovely and then you come out the next morning and some rotten Gone. slug has eaten through all the stems and they've fallen over onto the ground. So you need to watch that. Now, Thumbergia, hmm. was that named after someone? Because there's a lot of plants with yeah. Thumbergia as a suffix. Yeah, Thumberg was a very well-known plant ex uh, collector and explorer who brought a lot of plants back into Western cultivation, cultivation I should say, uh, from the Asian area. So hmm. yes, you'll find lots of plants with his name in it. Well, this has been amazing. Let us go on to the next. What a good idea. And a big thank you to John for letting us film his fritillaria. And in fact, John's collection of rare potted bulbs yeah. is a bit out of this world. So he's agreed for us to be able to go back and film him talking more about his culture because amazing things. Yeah, well, watch this space. Watch this space. <laughs> yes. And watch this space for our last green plant, which is... No, actually, it's not a green plant. They're all green. Green yeah. flower. <laughs> yes, green. And in fact, in some ways, it's tenuously even a flower. But anyhow, it's another one of the euphorbias. This time, euphorbia amygdaloides variety, Robbie Eye. Let's have a look. Well, when it comes to green flowers, euphorbias do it in spades. It seems to be the colour that they concentrate on. I mean, there are red, there are pink, there's lots of other euphorbias, but they do green a lot. And their flowers actually are the tiny little piece in the centre. What looks green is actually floral bracts. So it's actually the bracts that you're seeing in most euphorbias. This particular one was first discovered by a Miss Rob, and it's called Miss Rob's Bonnet uh, as a common name, which is a bit naff, but there you go. And it was initially called Euphorbia robiae after her. It has since been decided that it is actually a form of another species. So this particular Euphorbia is now Euphorbia amygdaloides robiae. So, what is it about this plant that makes it useful and interesting? One is the fact that it's in a, a suckering perennial, so it will make a good ground cover. It's very shade tolerant, unlike most euphorbias, which seem to like a fairly open sunny spot. And it's bright chartreuse green flower heads do stand up really well in the shade. And the only cultural requirement this plant seems to need is when the flowers are finished, I go in and take off the flowered stems right back to ground level. In the meantime, you've got next year's stems coming up. So it's a very easy care plant for dry shade. It will grow out in full sun too, I might add. It's also slightly thuggish. So be a bit careful where you use it because if you plant it somewhere that you decide later on you don't want it, you'll struggle to get rid of it. So be warned. Like a lot of the euphorbias from colder climates, and this one's European, it tends to flower in the sort of after the middle of winter, it will come into full bloom and it'll be in flower right through until mid spring. So it's got a long flowering period. And in fact, before the flower stems really go over, the flowers will get a pinky coppery color about them, which is actually quite pleasant. It's only when the flowers actually start to collapse and then you need to cut them down. Now, I am a little sad that Miss, Miss, Ms, Miss, Ms, Ms, Rob, she was a Miss back then. Yeah, the, I assume so. It yes. was the 19th century. Wasn't she 19th century? Uh, yeah, maybe early 20th century. Yeah. I'm not quite sure when she was on the scene, but uh, anyhow, she smuggled a bit of it back in her luggage and <laughs> ended up with something that was different than anybody had expected. So there you go. Like the best of it. But her name has kind of been sidelined somewhat. It's always sad when that happens. Yeah, well, she's still a variety. She's still a variety. <laughs> Even though she's not a species anymore. We can all you. aspire to that. Yeah. All right, well, does that bring us to the end of our amazing green flowered spectacle? It certainly does. So there you go. An, an interesting array of completely unrelated plants that have decided to throw flowers in shades of green. So a question from a gardening perspective and their use. So we've seen some things uh, in pots, we've seen things in your garden, in other people's gardens. How would you think about using green flowered plants in the garden in terms of, well literally where to use them? Because usually it's about foliage yep. or flower, texture, in this case, colour. In this case it's probably about texture more than anything else because when I use green flowered plants in the garden I tend to think of the flowers in much the same way as I would think of foliage because that makes it, sense. yeah because they're green and, and so you make that point with the euphorbia that mm, that lime is mm. so pingy particularly in winter yeah so so I can use them in almost any color combination because green will fit with anything yeah. so if I've got a hot border full of oranges reds and yellows you can uh, 
tone it down fractionally by using some green flowers in mm. it. You could also use green flowers in pastel shaded areas as well. So you could have it with your whites and pale pinks and lavenders and things. Mm. So it can work in almost any part of the garden, just using the right plant, right aspect uh, for whatever color combination you want to do. So really to think of it more as a foliage color and texture than a flower. Yeah, say. really, even though they are flowers, uh, uh, some of them are actually floral bracts, so they're not even, strictly mm. speaking, flowers in a sense. Let's not get into that. Oh uh, yes, it's all, all too deep. But, you know, so yes, think of them as foliage of a different texture and form. It's often a slightly different color to the actual foliage of the plant we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. So it just adds another tonal thing of green basically. There you go. Well, that has been very interesting and another epic that we've shot over the last month. So that's been fantastic to bring it to you today. And if you want to know what we're doing next week, you'll have to hit subscribe and the notification bell we post every Friday, Stephen. Yes. Yeah, so join us again next week. And we look forward to seeing you then. Bye. Bye all.